Now we're going to consider the simplest example of a non-inertial reference frame. That is, the frame of reference of a, of a person inside of a train car that's accelerating. So from that reference point, from that point of view, he can't, that observer can't uh, apply Newton's second law directly because there are extra weird so-called inertial forces that occur. And so the objective here is to try and figure out what those force or forces would be. So let's start off by uh, the point of view of a person who's standing beside the railroad tracks looking at the accelerating rail car. So that's this person here. So he's standing here on terra firma. Here's his coordinate system. And I'm going to call this x naught, y naught, and z naught. This is the inertial reference frame. It is stationary, not moving. And we're going to call it um, S naught. That's just the name for the frame. S naught means the inertial reference frame, the stationary reference frame. And this person is standing on the ground watching a train car that's accelerating. So here's the train car, and here's an observer in that train car, and there's going to be a coordinate system also attached to this, to the corner. Let's attach the origin of the coordinate system to the corner of the train car. Okay? And this observer is, um, is going to watch from that perspective. But this train car, so let's put some wheels on it, and let's say that this train is accelerating with an acceleration A. So it's not going to constant velocity, but accelerating from rest, for example. And this is going to be the non-inertial reference frame and it's accelerating. I'm going to call it frame S. Certainly in the inertial reference frame, I think you'll agree with me that if it's an inertial reference frame, then we can apply Newton's second law directly to the motion of an object. We sum up the forces, and we set those equal to the mass times the acceleration. So if this object, um, say we've got a mass right here, and this is the position vector of that mass, as seen in the inertial reference frame. So, we normally call it R, but I have to distinguish the position vector in the two frames. So let me call it R naught, where the, R, the zero reminds me that I'm in the inertial reference frame, the stationary frame. So if this is the position vector, then R naught dot is the velocity vector, and R naught double dot would be the acceleration vector. So this would be the acceleration of this mass m as seen by an observer in frame S0. Okay? Well, this observer can also see this mass, assuming there's a window on this box car, and the position vector of this mass we're going to denote by R. So this is the position vector of mass m as seen by an observer in the non-inertial reference frame, the one that's accelerating. 
Then we need one more bit of information. Uh, well, actually, what we're what we're really looking for is an equation like that. I'd like to be able to analyze the motion of this mass. It could be inside or outside the boxcar, doesn't matter. But this mass is moving around in space, and I want to try and follow its motion from the point of view of this observer in, the no in frame S, in the non-inertial reference frame. And I want to be able to look at the acceleration of this mass, R double dot, and set that equal to some forces. But we may not get something identical to Newton's second law. In fact, we won't. And there'll be an additional force, and that's what we're trying to find. In order to find that additional force, we're going to need one more vector. And it is the vector from here to here. So this vector r is the position of frame S with respect to S naught. And in particular, I mean the position of the origin of coordinates of frame S compared to the origin of coordinates of frame S naught. Well, if that's the position of this coordinate system, so that's the position of the corner of that train uh, relative to the, looks like the, the right foot of this observer. If that's the position, then I think you'll agree that if we take a time derivative of that position, that would give me the velocity of S with respect to S naught. And similarly, our double dot should give me the acceleration of S with respect to S naught. But we've been told that this frame is ac accelerating with ac acceleration A. We've given it a name. So this is, in fact, just A. Well, we're hoping to get an equation that looks like this, and we can, in fact, get it from here. So let me number that equation 1. And then let me look at this vector triangle here and see if I can get a relationship between r naught, r, and r. And I would claim that r naught is equal to big R plus little r. Why so? If you put the tail of the second vector, little r, at the tip of the big R vector, the first vector, then the resultant vector should go from where I started to where I ended, just like we talked about in chapter one. So we've got a relationship between these vectors. But I need not r naught, but instead I need r naught double dot. So we can take a first derivative and then a second derivative and lo and behold this second derivative is just the acceleration of that frame relative to the inertial frame and let me call it equation two, and let me substitute equation two into equation one. And see what happens. Well, sum on forces F equals mass times R naught double dot. I forgot the dots on this equation. 
So just to be clear here, I started from here and got to here and just forgot to put the dots here. Oh man, I forgot the dots right here too. Okay, so just to be clear, R0 is R plus R. Take two time derivatives of that equation and I get this one. Each one of the terms gets a second, uh, gets two dots, meaning a, a second time derivative. And then in this equation, I simply replaced this big R double dot by the acceleration of the frame right here. So now I want to insert this equation in for R not double dot in equation one. We're hoping for something that looks like this. Well, we can get this right hand side, in fact, this right hand side is sitting right in front of us here, m r double dot. And then this m times a is a, a term if I can bring it over to the left hand side and that will be this missing piece. So, I'd like to ask about what we've actually done here. This looks like the mass times the acceleration, this is the mass times the acceleration as seen in the accelerating frame. This, these are the forces on mass m seen by an observer in the inertial frame. And you might say, well, this mass has a force of gravity acting on it. There might be a normal force, there might be tension. These are the good old-fashioned forces that we've been dealing with our whole lives so far as physicists. This is an inertial force. seen only seen by the observer in the non inertial This is what we talked about last time. You get some extra forces that result when you apply Newton's laws. So now, uh, can you apply Newton's second law in this uh, non-inertial reference frame? Uh, the answer is you can't just say the sum on forces equals m r double dot. That doesn't work. But you can apply Newton's second law when rewritten in this form, when you include that extra inertial force acting on it. And so we might ask um, what that force actually looks like. Let's say this mass were inside here, inside the train car. And this guy inside the train car is watching that mass. Um, so let's say that the only force acting uh, as seen by an inertial observer, the only force acting is mg, for example. It's just in the air. Then, but when we analyze the, the, the motion as seen by this observer, there's an additional force, this f inertial. And let's ask what direction it's in. The train car is accelerating toward the right. 
Uh, but this force is minus the mass times that acceleration. If you take a vector to the right and multiply it by a minus sign, you get a, a force to the left. So there's an inertial force on this mass as seen by this observer. Don't be sucked into the idea that when you go back here you need to use that force. No, you just use the normal forces, the ten, uh, friction, whatever we normally do. But in the inertial, <clears throat> in the non-inertial reference frame, you need to take that into account. And what does that force really represent? <clears throat> well, let's say from the point of view of the inertial uh, observer, this ball is dropped from rest. And then from his point of view, it just drops straight down. Well, from this guy's point of view, well, let's do it for this ball right here. So from this guy's point of view, it just drops straight down. But from this guy's point of view, in the, inside the car, he's going to be moving toward the ball as, as it falls down. So to him, it's going to look like the ball has a, a, a trajectory that's toward him, a relative velocity in the horizontal direction. And the, to account for that, you need this inertial force.